Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. I'm sitting with my best friend, Tony. What's up, bud? What's going on, brother? Once again, it's our second podcast of the day, and we are at the Salt Lake City Beauty and Barber Expo in, well, I said at Salt Lake City. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't been to this area, uh, highly recommend it, uh, as you heard in the first podcast, that uh, it is stunning. Oh, my gosh. It's like there's no more beautiful place I think I've ever been to consistently. Right? Yeah. Like, like every hour we drove south a little bit, and like every hour the terrain changes, and it just gets prettier and prettier and prettier. It's like if this ain't God's country, I don't know what it is. A hundred percent, dude. I mean, and, 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 and you'll hear, hear us say this a hundred times. Pictures and uh, anything talking about it does not do it justice. No, no, it's not something to see. It's something to experience. A thousand percent. You know, and, that, and that's, that's, that's kind of, that's it, man. You have to experience it. Um, that noise that you hear behind you, we are at the Barber Expo, like I said. Um, big shout out to our man, Tyler Kelbert. Um, that's our dude. And uh, if you don't follow Tyler, a thousand percent follow Tyler. He's a, he's a gem for the industry. Yeah, not only an event planner, he's putting on a fantastic event. Uh, he's also a uh, one-shot award winner. And uh, he's a very talented uh, artist. I don't know how he does it all, man. You know, like he's he's unbelievably talented behind the chair, or you know, with his with his photography and what he's doing, and to be able to live this life and to, to plan something like this with with so many moving parts. I mean, this show is ten times the size of what with the show that we do. And we know how many moving parts we have. And he seems like he's at every show. I, exactly. Well, because he is at every, every show. <laughs> You know, yeah. it's so crazy, and we see him all the time, and um, it's it's really cool. It's really cool to be here to support him because he supports the industry so much. Yep, such a sweetheart of a guy. So with these things, we get to do live podcasts, and with live podcasts, we get to meet new friends. And you know, our our, our goal is, is to always meet new people and to dig deeper with the relationships that we already have. So you know, that that's the plan of every time we do an event. And today, we we kind of uh, we get to meet someone new. Kind of, kind of. I you mean, know, we've met, but never on the podcast. Yeah, before. a couple of years ago, we. Uh, was it in was it in LA or Orlando? Orlando. I think it was Orlando. 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 Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was Orlando. That's where we did the uh, the charity with um, uh, what's your name? With Sam. No, yeah, with and Sam. We did the haircutting at the uh, the. Uh, oh, why am I blanking? With what's her name? Rachel. Yeah, with Rachel, Rachel. Heil. Yeah, 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 yeah great yeah. person. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and she's the one that introduced us to Sean, and uh, we sat there we're, and we're like, you know, we got to get you on the podcast because uh, he has a. Uh, a pretty successful, uh, you know, he's a, an amazing entrepreneur. He has uh, seven. I shortchanged him earlier. Remember, I said four or five, but uh, you know, barbershops and a, and a one a hybrid, and uh, he, and also he's a he's a, a big time educator. And uh, so I, I would like to get into talking about someone who has time, right, to to do all this. Obviously, and he's a family man. So, uh, and, and we see him at all the shows. Yeah, and uh, so. Uh, so we want to thank Rachel for introducing us to Sean, and, and, and unfortunately, it took us this long to get him on the podcast. But, but here we are. Time you know, is here, everything. Right? Yeah. God's country. That's right. <laughs> God's country. Exactly. There he goes. <laughs> so uh, welcome to the podcast, Mr. Sean Casey. Um, you can follow him on Instagram at Twin Cuts underscore CEO. Sean, man, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me here. Yeah, brother. It's a pleasure for Abs- sure. Absolutely. Yeah. When did you get in? I got in one a.m. This morning. This morning. Oh. Oh. Like, I've learned, you were talking about so much traveling and, and doing this all the time. It's a beautiful, like, you're right. The air is fresh. It's just a beautiful scene. But I'm at the stage where a lot of my shows, I like to walk off the plane on the stage and back on the plane and get back home. I, I feel <laughs> that, dude. I feel that. I, we, were, we actually just talked about it earlier, but, like, after a show, I just kind of want to blink and be home. Yeah. You know? yeah, I do enjoy those moments, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How long did it take you to get out here? Uh, all right, so maybe 
eight hours. It was like a, I had a two and a two hour layover in Atlanta, three hour layover in Atlanta, and Atlanta I shot over here. To Salt Lake City? Yeah. Where, yeah. where do you live? In Southwest Florida, Fort Myers, Florida. Oh, yeah. awesome. I love that area. I love yeah. the West Coast of Florida. Man. It's a great area. Uh, there's so yeah. much to talk to unpack there. Yeah. But where are you from originally? Originally from New York, right in the city. Really? Yeah, born and raised. Yeah. Really? How'd you end up in Florida? Uh, family, grandparents. My son lived there. I was going back and forth a lot. City got to me. Uh -huh. It was that opportunity to say, hey, you know what? Let me get a, I'm, I'm tired of hearing sirens <laughs> all day, every day. I just needed a break. And I really, it was unexpected. I, I took a couple of weeks in Florida, stayed with my grandparents, sp spending a little bit more time with my son. And I was like, all right, let me start working. Right. I just worked at a random barbershop from a guy that I knew that lived in the area. A month later, I packed up my bags and I moved there. And it's in, this is the Fort Myers uh, and this was area? This Fort Myers area, yeah. Uh, I just felt like it was a better success. For me in the city, was everything was going fast, fast, fast. But I always felt there was some type of blockage. And maybe it was just me being closer to the foundation and my son. And I think that was a big, strong element of me finally making that move. And I think that's what helped me to kind of settle it down and make a more realistic dream for me than just being a barber and turning that more into a career that eventually turned into an entrepreneurship for me. So when you were in New York, you were just like behind the chair, fading yeah. it up, cutting it up? Mm -hmm. Yes. A lot of networking was in this place called Astor Place, which is like a very classic barbershop, lower Manhattan. It used to be three stories, about 90 barbers. Every picture on the wall was like a celebrity from like dating back to the 70s, 80s, from Mike Tyson to New York Mets to the Yankees to Spike Lee to anybody and anybody would go to that shop. So I used to work there and just great opportunity. I think if I was... Uh, by myself and I didn't have a child, it probably would be more on the freelance tip in New York, but you know, just trying to get that foundation. I think balance is important in this industry. You work so hard, but you got to have a little bit of family balance as well. I think that's where the most success comes from. For sure. For sure. So you, you, so you started your bar, your, your, your barber shops there? I did start there. So when I, I moved there in uh, 2006 and when I went there, I knew it was going to be a little different for me. I, I was going to have to start all over. Uh, money's different. Things were cheaper. It was a cheaper cost of living to be out there during that time. But uh, haircuts were a lot cheaper compared to the city prices. And um, I knew that I had to kind of like mature my mind to get into an entrepreneur mindset because I was such an artist and I just liked cutting hair. Mm -hmm. So I gave myself about a four, like a five-year plan to start my first shop and just kind of busted my ass. First one in the shop, last one to leave. I started doing some like open mics and some like, night in life promotion because I used to intern in New York so I took some of that you know ran my business like how I learned how people ran a music business and it kind of blended it together got some finance and, and started my first shop in 2010 did you self-finance or you got financing outside self-financed wow, yeah. wow. self-financed so what was your five-year plan so you're sitting there you're behind the chair you're working it and then you're like in five years I'm gonna do a barbershop yeah I thought that would be the best way to make money than just, I, I, I think I could only get so high behind the chair um, financially, make the moves that I need to. So I f felt I had to get into the shop and that would expand my, 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 my money and my, my, my life a little bit more. I never thought at that time that I wanted to have multiple shops. I just wanted one shop and, you know, make the best shop of it. And then I quickly realized that you don't make a lot of money owning one shop either. So there's a lot of work to that. So as you're growing one shop now, you're thinking about, okay, maybe two shops. But how did you get into the education side of this? Because, I mean, you're huge in the education. Well, the education was just weird. I think just uh, the development of, like, social media. Um, you know, I built my, my brand off of MySpace. I was like that guy putting flyers up on MySpace when everybody was just kind of doing using it as a chat message. So I was promoting my myself and I was promoting nightlife and that's how I was able to to finance myself in my shop and once Facebook came back uh, came out I was I was using that as a platform you, you know in New York that didn't exist for me it was like me sh actually shaking strangers hands and going to Kinko's across the street and cutting up a piece of paper into 12 pieces with my number and, and, and a logo and handing it out to people trying to get haircuts so I looked at that as a great promotional platform for me so being involved and starting taking uh, the social media platforms and, and utilizing that a little bit more, I don't know what platform popped up, but I saw that there was a 
barber battle in West Palm Beach. And I drove and checked it out, and I realized, wow, there's an industry behind this that I didn't know about. And it just kind of inspired me. And uh, I really went in there as, as not to be an educator. I never thought I was going to be an educator. I used to go there because it was very inspiring, and I wanted to get better behind the chair. And the more you go to it, the more people you meet, and it just kind of falls in place. You, you, you become what you were supposed to be. Right. Mm. Were you encouraging uh, the people that, that worked for you to do the same? I was, you know, but nobody's going to listen. It's just got to happen for them when, when the timing's right. You right. know, and I think what, what a lot of things that happened for me is a little bit being innovative and, and taking an early start to that as well and not listening to the to the crowd of people and just kind of listening to myself and saying, wow, this is awesome. I had a little bit of a competitive spirit as well because uh, I would go there and in my mind, even though if I was working with barbers, I still wanted to be the best. So if I go to, a, to an event and I see an educator cutting and he's doing an amazing job and I grab that tidbit and I bring it back to the shop, it kind of separates me from everybody else. So... I would put it out there like you guys could go, but as it got more popular, everybody else started coming to the show. But, you know, the more people come, the harder to get the opportunities because you got more fish in the barrel at that point. So, right. Wow. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive. I mean, because to, to, obviously you were young, you know, uh, what, unless you just – you're older and you look young because you still look young to me. <laughs> but, you know, in 2010, you got your first shop. When was shop number two? Out? When It was three years later. It was in 2013. Wow. So uh, that happened because I had started a six-man shop. I got a location that was about 1,600 square foot, which I realize now I don't need that much space. But I was trying to do, like, the over-the-top barbershop, but at the same time, you know, not realizing, wow, I'm paying a lot of rent as well. So I started adding more chairs to that location. And we built up a really strong team, and I built up a lot of connections. I'm, I'm a strong community person, so I, I believe in building with the small businesses. I believe with building with the community as far as anything I can help, needs, charities, anything. It's like it's, it's the number one aspect to, to, get a, to, to create a brand even for yourself, being involved with the community, especially in, in Southwest Florida. It's very seasonal. So when people are gone for the summer, you rely on the local market. So being involved allowed me to maintain such a strong shop. With that, we were close enough to a uh, college, um, Florida Gulf Coast University, FGCU. And I was cutting all the basketball players of the team and the soccer team, the baseball team. And they were bringing all the guys over. And I couldn't hire anybody. And we were turning people away. And the college, like wins an SB for being the first number 15 seed to be the number one seed or number two seed with Georgetown and ESPN was out and they became superstars and rock stars. So I actually did a, a logo like a, a, a eagle and a basketball on one of the center's head and it went viral. ESPN, USA picture of the day and I got a NCAA a, a, a letter to remove the, the, the image but it did enough damage so everybody knew matter. about the shop, right? So that summer, I said to myself, it's important for me to get a shop closer to that college because if I don't do it, there's going to be somebody else who's going to do it. For sure. So I've built up the area that I'm at plus the college kids. So if I'm going to lose my competition, I might as well lose it to myself. And that's why I took that risk. And I opened up that second location and where those guys can still have maintained their, their local um, clientele. And the new clientele was, was going to become like a almost like a, the college shop and it did day one I had 10 barbers working the whole team came in took pictures I had a big mural of FGCU in the back the president of the campus came so we were like successful off bat and that just kind of started the motion of me um, scaling my businesses wow I mean how did how did you get so like you said you know you had to learn the, the business side the entrepreneurial side is it were you studying or do you just gut instinct I think it's more gut in instinct. I'm willing to take risks. That, you know, I don't think it always works out, but I've learned in life, like, I, I didn't go to college, but I know it's expensive to go to college. It costs, if you go to a semester, I don't know how much it costs, maybe 10,000 bucks a semester or yearly, whatever it is. So if I take losses financially on life lessons learned to establish my own business, any loss that I take, I look at it as me paying a tuition in college, mm -hmm. but in life. So I never look at losses. I just know I'm not going to make those mistakes again. 
So when I feel or believe I, I can do something, I'm willing to take those chances and take those risks. Dude, you just blew my mind. I, I've never put it that way. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah, that dude, thank you for that nugget, man. Mm-hmm. That was brilliant. Well, I, I, I wonder, like, they must be really big mistakes if it's going to cost you ten grand. Yeah, I haven't lost that much. <laughs> <laughs> just come here. Like, it's going to be a big college. lesson learned. <laughs> but I've lost. I've taken losses for right. sure. You know, the along the way. Community the college level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even to start up on my first yeah. shop to how I scaled my business to where it's now, like my startup money to get the, the business going is I've yeah. learned to cut corners and save a lot of money. But I think it's better that I did it for myself and learned that way than somebody holding my hand and guiding me through the process. Right. Sure. What, well, hold, hold our listeners' hands. Like, what were some of those lessons learned? <sighs> Making money off of every square foot of your unit, maximizing, looking, liking to cut costs. I, you know, I did a break room, and I did, like, a vending machines, and I did only six chairs. And, I, you know, I wanted to look great, which is great, you know. But at that time, I was doing a booth rent system, so I was capping myself out. So all those extras that I was paying for, I'm paying on my lease, wasn't coming back to me. So I was never really maximizing the type of money that I, that I can make, right? So now my, I've switched over my system where I do commission services, which is better in the long run. But that's one of the things is just kind of like the startup, going onto your local government site, downloading your business plan, going through the, each step of your licensing, what, what, what type of tax that you're trying to um, utilize when you're doing your business, just all those steps, go in order, and then really write down all your finances and seeing what it really costs, how many people you need to be working in, how much money you should be making per month. Like, I wasn't looking at that. I was just like, hey, I'm Twin Cuts. I got a busy clientele. I can hire a bunch of guys, and I'm cutting hair for free. That was my mindset in my first shop. Right. right. Oh, I got six guys. If they're cutting hair, I never have to pay rent because I'm coming from a shop paying rent. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm rich. Yeah. No, I'm not rich, but I needed that to understand what the next level of my life was. Sure. So that, that original, that original barbershop, you still have it? I, I no, I moved it. And, uh, that, honest, I moved, moved it at 10 years, so I downscaled the business. Again, it was like 16, 1,700 square feet. The area grew tremendously in the area. They weren't working with me. I was already spending a lot of money. I took my crew. I moved it down the street and saved $1,200 a month on rent. Wow. Which is $1,200 in your pocket. In this $1,200 a month. You know, yeah, that's good. yeah. So it's twelve thousand dollars a year extra. You know that I can put towards my other businesses for marketing, promotion, and establish my next business as well. So that's awesome. So when so when you went from like a rental barber shop into a commission barber shop, what was that conversation with with your rental with your renters? Well, it was kind of like a, a little bit of a cheat code, and it was so it was a gift and curse because I did it right after the pandemic. So when at the lowest point of my shop, I've always talked about doing it and it was always scary for me because I said, once I do this, I'm going to lose my barbers. You get so nervous and you're so fixed with the system that works for you, but you know you need to make changes and you know the struggle and headaches that you get. So I took that opportunity. I was just sitting down those couple of months when nothing was open and I still had to pay all my landlords and my barbers didn't understand that part. So then it's kind of like that mentality, like I have responsibilities and I have to figure out how to pay these companies on the back end and how to pull out money so I can keep up and and keep my business afloat. I said, it's no better time for me to do it because this is the lowest point that my shops can be at. Mm -hmm. So I did it and, you know, I did lose a good amount. I also did keep a lot. And uh, since then, I haven't I haven't looked back and I've, I've learned and I've scaled that even better from when I did it day one and I understood the system a little bit more and it really is a lot more stress free for me because when I was doing booth rent and you lose a couple of barbers you never just lose one barber at a time you lose one or two and sometimes three those guys build a a relationship with each other and the next thing oh this new new business is opening or I'm going to open my own shop there's things come along the way so when you're set on your money you know, and you got you got family, and you you, you know you're paying your kids school, and you, you you thinking you're getting this money every single month. When that changes and they leave, you're thinking about okay, two hundred dollars in rent, you lose three dollars, six hundred a week, times four in a month. Yeah. And you got to find them three new people, and you got to start them low and build them back up. There's a long process and a lot of hard work for me to do sure. that. 
than me saying, okay, well, let me do commission. Not everyone, it may not work for everybody. They may outgrow me. But, and I think this is where the education came in. And it was important for me to be educate was training them at a young age to understand that you're, you may, you, it's a good chance you may outgrow me. But now I have a team. So if two guys do leave, the customers are still coming into the building. Those other five guys are just going to cut a little bit more. And I'm still going to see the same income monthly and annually. That was the most important thing for me to kind of uh, realize when I was making that change. So it sounds like you just got to be open-minded and be able to adapt depending on your, on your situation or your circle, you know. For sure. Uh, and, and it seems like you're, you're good at that, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, is that, you think that's just being like a New Yorker, like, you know, just kind of just I think it helps. hustling. And, I think yeah. it helps just being in the fast market, but I think anybody can really achieve that. I think it's just the scariest thing to get out of your comfort zone. Sure. Right? And knowing that, like, if you know that you're not going to allow yourself to, to fail, then go for it. You know, it's like an old saying, you never know how fast you can run until a dog runs behind you. <laughs> That's true. I've never heard that saying, but I understand <laughs> it. <laughs> so I like my back against the wall a lot of times because you get very comfortable. You're in a place and you get, you know, and you're afraid to make those moves. But sometimes you just make those moves, put that pressure on yourself. And if you're that type of person, you're naturally going to get up an hour earlier, stay a little later. You're just going to make the decisions that you need to do not to fail if, you're not, if you have the mentality not to fall. Yeah, this well, comment took me back. I was uh, about 13, maybe 14, and I remember I, we were running, and I hopped this fence and uh, to cut through somebody's yard. Next thing you know, these two great, uh, great Danes uh, come around the corner and, uh, I mean, barking and, and just hauling toward me. I just remember, I, I don't think I ever ran so fast. And I got to the fence, and I didn't hop over, I just dove over, and they <laughs> right. were like literally right there. But that's but exactly. it's so true. Yeah. You you'd never know what we're capable of, right? Uh, we always put limitations on ourselves. I think it's, it's mental, Yeah. right? And it's not built for everybody, but I believe everybody can do it if they could just kind of understand their own mental state. And just, what do you really want in life? Here's another probably uh, a circumstance that you had to overcome, and if not, maybe you were blessed through it. But you guys uh, got crushed by a hurricane. Yes. Did it did it impact or did it, uh, did it hurt your business? Yeah, it didn't. And you know, they were operational, but yes, we were definitely shut down. There was damages that need to be done. Thankfully, that none of my locations were by an area that they got flooded out. Um, it was a rough time, for sure, but I was very fortunate to stay in business and I didn't lose my business. We did a uh, great community service where I partnered with um, a company that I, I educate with, Andis, and we got a whole bunch of retail um, tools and provided haircuts for, for two days to all the service people. Oh, wow. Yeah, so anybody, electricians and uh, hospitals, anybody that can come in and they can get a free haircut and they can walk away and they can get a shit they could take home their own shaver and clipper and uh we did it at one of my shops and had my guys working all day long took care of them for doing the services as well it was a great event so it was just you know it was bad but it was a way of just kind of giving back and being thankful for for that yeah because the pictures that i saw for from sanibel island and fort myers i mean it was devastating yeah it was yeah. scary it was, yeah. Yeah. it's a tough did, time did you stay in town I for did. that oh i did <laughs> That was uh, when you're talking about your asshole being puckered, puckered up like a decimal point for 12 hours. That's really what that experience was. So I was like, I had my grandmother and my daughter in my house. And I'm like, okay, we're good because I got these hurricane shutters that naturally came with the home, old school, like metal, easy to put on. I'm like, we're fine. But my front door was like, till I found out during that storm, was a little weathered. So, like, it kept sucking in and sucking out. And this whole time, I'm trying to create a barricade. And I'm like, oh, my God. I did everything I'm supposed to. Did I just kill my family <laughs> because I, didn't, I overlooked the door? So, just very fortunate because there was a lot of, a lot of people that are still, right now, we just did the year anniversary. And so, there was a, there's still a lot of people that are struggling. It's a, insurance is a mess out there. There's people that are still homeless. I got a good friend of mine that has half of a roof. They can't do anything, and they got oh they're gosh. fighting an insurance battle, and it's just like it's a burden on, on many. So, so what? So in the future, if you were to do 
like future barber shops, would you make sure they're out of the flood zone? I think, yeah. I don't think I'm going to be doing anything by the beach anytime soon. Yeah. Does Maybe. That, does the insurance affect the business as well? Because I know uh, insurance companies have been raising the rates on the homes. Like, I mean, crazy. They've been pulling out, too. Yeah. yeah leaving, I heard, leaving people, like, uninsured. Yeah. And then are they doing it, doing that to businesses as well? Yeah, both. Oh Dropping businesses and home and, and residential. It's yeah. rough. Yeah. It really um, is. My wife has a, uh, a cousin. And they raised her insurance to sixteen thousand a year. You know, I'm like, you know, house insurance. Yeah, for homeowners insurance, sixteen thousand a year. I'd rather just like, you know what? I'll save the money and and take care of my own damages. If the house burns down, it burns down. At that point, you do two years of that. It's just like almost putting a a payment on a new house. Right. Saving that type of money. You're talking thirty. What's that? Thirty-two thousand dollars. You can put that down. Years, right? Right. 10% 10% down on another home. Not in Florida right now, though. Real estate is, is shot up four times the amount that what it was maybe three, four years ago. Uh, I find that odd, too. I mean, with the insurance rates being so high, like, and they're only going to go up, right? I mean, insurance rates never come down. Right. Right? Like, they're only going up. It's, it's like interest rates, right? Like, when interest rates are high, it's supposed to slow, right. you know, slow home sales. That, that doesn't seem to be bothering you either, you know? Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we were in Sanibel uh, uh, the year before the hurricane, and we just felt in love with, with the area. It's beautiful. Yeah, and we spent some time over in Fort Myers, and we just love that whole area. Mm-hmm. Calm, great fishing, good life. I mean, I bought a truck with this whole setup to go to the beach. I used it three times before the hurricane hit. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even have a beach to go to, but I still have all the stuff. So we're, they're working on, on it quick. So Fort Myers Beach is going to probably be like Lauderdale Beach, the way they're developing it now. Every, you know, all these big companies came in and bought up all the land. That's know, what they like, do. It was right? like a facelift. You know, all the, all the little silver jewelry stores and T-shirt stores that like have been there since the 60s that you couldn't move them out don't exist. So now they have a flat piece of land to play with. So of course- wow. They can build up. They build up. They build up. Yeah. But the city, uh, they, they built that bridge to Santa Bell real quick. Very quick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Very quick. Yeah, I don't know if I want to be on that bridge. <laughs> There's a lot of politics, right? <laughs> right. You know, people, you know the, governor, the governor's trying to win that election. So of course he's like, build that up. <laughs> Get the light. Build that, build that bridge. Put that, ba- <laughs> build that, that bridge. band-aid on the, on the electrical pole. Right. Work it today. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Hey, so if you're a young barber and like your your dream is to open a barber shop, like, can you walk us through like like, in what steps that you need to start thinking or in what steps that you need to take in order to do that? And if it's a five year plan or whatever, I think my suggestion is give yourself some type of plan. I feel like five is reasonable. I think everybody should be somewhere elevated every five years, and you just challenge yourself. So if you're just starting out. I think you, you, within two years, if you really work hard, you can build up a really strong book for yourself. You can understand the businesses. You can, you can uh, be accountable of the mistakes that you make early in your barbering career, whether it's your professional mistakes, whether it's your technical mistakes. You can be honest, how to, how to deal with people. You know, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people want to be me right out of school and have multiple shops without understanding the business. And I see it all the time. Guys don't have the passion and patience to sit through those early stages but to be a successful business i think you need to go in there and 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 really create a full book for yourself because you're going to build it up and you're going to make good money and you're going to lose clients because you're going to get lazy if you're young and you spend it on stupid things Mm -hmm. so you you understand those 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 you know losses and, and 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 victories that you gain along the way and i believe once you have enough like a fully established book then you have the opportunity of what do you want to do? Do you want to get into like a salon or, or a segregated barber suite, or you want to do like an actual barber shop? And I think it's important that if you open up your first shop, that you have enough clientele to pay all your bills without relying on anybody else. Because if you don't really have that, then you got to kind of bend backwards and hire people that may not really adapt to what your system is. Right. And that's a big mistake. And then you kind of lose what you were really trying to achieve and it doesn't feel like your business anymore. You almost become a operating manager in your own business that has a lease tied to them. So if you can start your business and cover all your, all your clients can pay 
you make enough money with your own clients to cover all the bills, then you can be patient and select the right people that can work in your business and really like provide the atmosphere that you're achieving for and, and, and whatever your your style. I don't. I, I never agree that there's a professional shop. I've been. I've worked in the the urban shop, the hipster shop, the this shop. You know, I've seen them all. I've I've, I've taught classes in all of them, and I think they all can work efficiently. But you got to design it what works for your best personality. And if you're going to do it, develop a brand because that is your second home. And from there, you know, take that same mentality that you did building up your book behind the chair. How do you maximize it on your business? Well, you're going to have to sacrifice a little bit, step back from your, from your business, and give yourself time to work on your business. And then look at that number, and then that allows you to move that money forward and push it onto your, um, to your next business if you're looking to scale your, your shops. How many employees do you have? Oh, so I have probably between 60 to 70. Wow. It's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. A lot of personality. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. How, do, how do you, that's where I'm going next. Like, how, how do you manage that? Like, how, there's 70 different personalities. There's 70 different egos. There's 70 different whatever. Like, how do you manage that? And, you know, to Tony's point earlier, like, I'm going to assume you don't have any education in that, you know. So how, how, do, you, how do you have that skill? Or how do you gain I that skill? I developed a great team. So I had a, a, go, a good friend of mine where I used to do promotions with, and he knew how to um, start up n- nightclubs and knew how to start up restaurants. And we had a good friendship. And he saw that I was overworked and saw that I had a good thing, and he says, how can I come and help you with this? You know, well, what's this look like? What's, mm-hmm. what's the money? It looks like it doesn't cost a lot to get it started. How can I help you? And I told him, this is what I'm great at, and these are the things that don't inspire me. And the things that didn't inspire me, he was great at. So it worked well together. And from there, as we grew, we were able to open the door as I scaled into more businesses, finding people within my own team that have found interest of buying into small percentages of my business to run it as operating owners, as smaller percentages. So that helped me take away a lot of the stress of being at all my locations. So you find those few guys that may not necessarily want their own shop and 100% responsibility and want a a system that that can help build around them. So that works for them. So as I develop, it's just kind of slowly putting the right people together as I keep growing. Because it would be too much for myself and I wouldn't be able to do the things that I'm doing today. Which in Return is just as equally important because me being out at these shows and being a brand and and networking with the right people brings an elevated look to my shop. So when when students are trying to come to the shop, they look at what I'm doing in the industry. So they're they're kind of encouraged to come ask me questions about what Twin Cuts looks like. And business model, he but. Uh, he had a shop, and if you're interested in o- opening up your own shop, he would give you the uh, the minority partnership, and you guys would go, you know, open up a new shop. And sitting right now, I think he has 15 or 16 shops, but he has like s- small minority partnerships right. uh, in all those shops, and they're all very successful. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it does it creates a culture, it creates a uh, a team uh, amongst all the shops as well, because each owner uh, they would have their their gatherings and, and just kind of like iron sharp and iron it's con- constantly Absolutely. bounce off yeah, that's, good. that's a brilliant business model do you so when they when they buy into the company are they buying into like the overall company or just the the salon that they're in the salon that they're in they're buying into the financial profits only so i'm still a hundred percent owner of twin cuts the oh, brand that itself down. Okay, so Twin Cuts, is that also the name of the barbershop? That's the name of my, yeah, my shop. So even my studio, I have six barbershops called Twin Cuts, and I have Twin Cuts Studio, where I change the color scheme, and I do 70% cosmetology services and 30% barbering services at that location. So now I have two models, Um, and I even have a franchise packet on my website if people are interested. So there's one cost for the barbershop model, and I have a cost that's a little bit more for the salon model. So I keep the brand. You can never change Twin Cuts. You can't change the color scheme. You can't change the letter. I always will have the final say, but what I do provide is somebody to buy in. So whatever that 
the 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 profit um, quarterly is you get you buy in percentage of that location working into that, so you have a little bit of skin in the game. Right. Yeah. Which makes sense. So when you come out to shows like these, are you are you with a brand or are you with Twin Cuts? I'm with a brand. So, sometimes I go with myself, but for the most part, so I'm um, at this this show. I'm with Level Three. Okay. Yeah. So I have their product. I have all their products in my. I have a partnership with them, so we sell all their products in my locations as well. Oh wow! So with uh, do you have a retail percentage that that your barbers must maintain? I don't mean must, but you know what I'm saying. Right. That's encouraged. Yeah, I try. I try. You know, it's up and down. Up and down. It's. It's part of education that I try to tell them to not look at themselves as a salesman and mm-hmm. just kind of just, we have a back bar, put the product on everybody's hair. Because at the end of the day, when you do a great haircut and you put the product in, they're going to ask what the product is. So we just encourage sure. them to at least do that. So you have ups and downs in sales. I'm, I'm, uh, my salon, of course, my, my barber salon sells the most because we do cosmetology services. So... Uh, Longer hair um, guests and color guests buy products more than your standard barber. Sure. Right? So it's up and down with the barber shop, but we still have it, and I'll never go away from it. So we see, we, it's, it, it, we see better months than others when it comes to the products. It's funny. I, uh, I did this experiment with the, the salon that, that we were with for 20 years, and, uh, and it was about retail sales. And... Uh, we took uh, someone that was only had 7% recent retail sales. And so I said, you know what? Let's put whatever product that you use, use it, explain what you use, and just set it up on the counter. And when they were checking out, the front desk said, these are the products that Tony used on you today. Uh, would you like to take these home with you? Or would you like to take any of these home with you? And that, that week, it went from 7% to 20%. Without any sales. It's just, you know, when they were done, they just put, set it up there, and the front desk said, these are the products Tony used. Would you like to take? And we were blown away, and then uh, uh, we sat down with uh, Reg, who, uh, uh, who's the, uh, the owner of all the salons, and he, he wanted to kind of implement in all this and, uh, into all the, all the shops. It was just amazing just how simple, uh, not looking at it like you're a salesman, you know what I mean? It's just, hey, this is what I use. I'm just, you know, and leave it at that. Mm-hmm. And uh, you'll be surprised how many of them will, you know, want to use it and take it home because the way they, they look. Right, right. I think this, this get the salesman out your mind when, when selling products because majority of barbers and stylists are artists. So we, we like to create art on hair. You know, yeah. we look at the fading, the shading, the lining, the coloring, the, the gradiencies, all that stuff. We look at that and the business aspect, because many of us didn't go to college or took business courses. We graduate high school. We go to a trade school. We get into a shop. We get into a salon. And all we knew is to make people look beautiful or make them look handsome. Yeah. So the, the, the thought process of like sales is not there. So they overthink the sales. And the reality is, is just incorporate it to your overall, you know, work that you're doing and just have it there. Like, limit, put it in there. We keep it in the front. What did you use? We have it up front. It's available to buy. And yeah. a lot of times they buy it. Yep. You know, it's just like it, the way that I think about it is like, it's like Bob Ross, right? Like Bob Ross is a painter, true My artist. mentor. Your mentor, mm-hmm. right? Him and Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers, I get it, totally. <laughs> but like, but but he'll tell you what brush you're using and how to use it. That's mm-hmm. basically all you're doing as a salesperson. Hey, this so is the product funny. I'm using. This is how I'm using it, right? Mm-hmm. And then I guarantee that he sold a bunch of brushes just because he said this is what he was using because he wanted to, because to recreate that, to re- recreate that use. I couldn't agree more. I use that as my <laughs> analogy of my education. Like no, you don't. Mark. Yeah, similar, similar. I'm like, when I'm trying to talk about, like, his brush strokes, he's like, take the little fan, bro. You think he messed up the painting. He did the beautiful ocean and the sky. Then he takes this big brown line down the middle. You're like, he messed up the, hair, the, the painting. And he takes his fan brush and goes, here's my little pretty branch. <laughs> and one little light stroke, and it appears, right? He's selling his paint. He's se- you know? Exactly. My Arburn Brown dusk <laughs> mixed with my friend. and he's selling his pad and he said without having to be a salesman he's showing his artwork 
And at the end, he has his website and you can buy that whole kit because it's believable and it's achievable that you think you can paint like that at home. So that's what the products, when you put it on someone's hair, that's how they should feel. Like, I can do this for myself. So, oh, that's what you did to make it look this way? Let me buy a, let, let me buy a puck, puck of that pomade. Right. <laughs> Are you selling Element 3 at the, at the uh, salon as well, the hybrid? Yeah. Yes, so we sell level three at all of them. At the Salando, we also sell Redken products for, for the color and the shampoos. We have a little bit of a Paul Mitchell tea tree. We, we have a little bit more diversity with the other products mm -hmm. um, at the salon. But all my shops, were, we, we were heavy with level three. Love, Perfect. love it. So what? share with our listeners, uh, uh, like, or is, is there anything that you would like to share with our listeners that 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 you think that could uh, when I'm, uh, be helpful? Helpful, yeah. As far as like, you know, as a young barber, as a young cosmetologist, you know, things to focus on. Think, was it? Is it education? Is it uh, the skill? Is it you know teamwork? I mean, what can you share with them that can grow them? As individuals, I think to achieve all of what you said, because it all plays under an umbrella of hair, the professionalism, the education, the continuing education, is to maintain a white belt mentality. So when you're a white belt, you're a beginner, you're a sponge, you absorb everything. They're the they're the easiest learner because they're learning everything. But when you're a black belt, you're a master. It's harder to learn new things. You've reached the highest level. So if you stick with a white, ment uh, white belt mentality, you're always going to be adaptive to learn new ideas. And that falls into all those categories that you said. Your professionalism, your passion, your products, your sales, your techniques. Continuously learn from people, whether it's 10% of so from somebody or it's the full package. There's always something to take from somebody that you can apply to your own um, to your own self to elevate you to your next level. And, and, and I'll be honest, I've learned quite a bit from you today. I mean, I've, you know, I, I, I was blown away with some of your comments and uh, I, I thank you truly for uh, being with us, man. Yeah, I, pre I appreciate these platforms that you guys do. I love the consistency. It's not easy to go in from show to show, um, interviewing, you know, us and giving us an opportunity to speak. And it's just... These are, these are things that are needed in our industry, and, and people who are taking that time to pay attention to stuff like this, it's important because, you know, it's like reading a book. There's, there's nuggets with everybody you speak to that somebody can take, you know, within their own, own, own experience in their own world. It's funny that you said nugget because we use that all the time in the podcast. You know what I mean? Oh, that's, that's going to be a great little nugget. And you've, you've shared a few nuggets, which is we appreciate. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate appreciate you taking time off of, uh, yeah. you know, your, your busy day here. You gave me a chance to sit down. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. We only get to sit down, though. Yeah. yeah. You know? So how can our listeners find you and, and just learn more about everything you're doing? So I have a couple of things. Uh, one on Instagram and, and TikTok and everything. It's TwinCuts underscore CEO. Every day I create tidbits of education. Mm. Startup. That's, my, that's my, my strength. That's my passion. I love the beginning learner. So if you watch my page, you'll see little tidbits of, of learning new techniques all around the board. Um, through that, I have an online academy called uh, SeanCaseyAcademy.com which has walk-through haircuts, seven walk-through haircuts, plus a lot of small information, and I also have a business uh, masterclass incorporated with that. There's different tiers, and it's a subscription platform. If you're interested for a haircut or franchise opportunities, you can go to Twin Cuts with a Z, T-W-I-N-C-U-T-Z, dot com. We have a breakdown on, on what my shop is if you're interested in, in you know, looking to franchise a business. That's available. And uh, finally, I'm, you know, when is this going to air? Uh, you say? I'm After November? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. So I am in the process of starting my own physical 
Barber Academy in Fort Myers. Oh, awesome. Congrats, yeah. man. So I'm, you know, looking forward to that if you're in the Southwest area and you're looking to become a barber, a licensed barber, my academy should be open by May, June. That's See, awesome. I, I know what I think him and Tyler have in common is the youth, man. I mean, that's a lot that you're juggling. And uh, it seems like everything you touch is, is, uh, is a success, man. Great. Just like Tyler and appreciate him having me here and, and doing something like this. But uh, I'm sure he has a good team around him as well. So I know he has Mike running around with him. And, and I think it's important to, to develop the right people around you to make these, th- make these moves happen. For yeah. sure. Awesome. For sure. Mr. Sean Casey, thank you so appreciate much for hanging out with us. And thank, thank you very you. much. Yes, yeah, it's your thing. And thank you for joining us on your day off. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating, and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hairdistry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.